Good evening, Starville Church. I hope you've had a great week so far. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service. I'd like to read some verses from Psalm 71, uh, verse 3. It says this, Be to me a rock of refuge, to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. And just that phrase at the beginning of the verse, to which I continually come. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's like, Lord, here I am again. <laughs> and we almost come apologetically. But he doesn't have that attitude. He is our rock that we can come to, it says, continually, time after time, multiple times a day. We need to go to him because he is our rock. He is our refuge. He is that stable point in our life. So we need to constantly go to him. Let's just go to him once again in prayer tonight to say, Lord, would you meet with us in this service because you are that rock that we come to time and time again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. Lord, we're thankful for this service. We're thankful, Lord, you're going to speak to us tonight, and we want to respond to that. But Lord, we want to have that attitude of the psalmist, Lord. You're our rock that we come to time and time again. Continually, we can come to you because you're stable, you're tried and true, and we thank you for that. Move in our hearts tonight in this service. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, church. Let's sing together, Let the Earth Rejoice.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and we ask for your mercy and your love, Lord, to fall upon us and open our hearts, O oh Lord, that we can receive your word, that we can use it, Lord, to go forth to do your bidding. Father, we thank you for tonight's service. We ask that you would anoint the speaker and anoint our hearts to receive your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hi, this is the modern Hebrew pronunciation. I will say the letter, then the pronunciation. Some letters have two sounds. Alif, A. Bet, Ba. Vet, Va. Gimal, Ga. Dalet, Da. He, Ha. Vav, Va. Zayin, Za. Het, Ha. And sometimes it's pronounced Kha. Tit, Ta. Yud, Ya. Kaf, Ka. Khaf, Kha. Lamed, La. Mem, Ma. Nun, Na. Samikh, Sa. Ayin, A. Pe, Pa. Fe, Fa. Tsadi, Tsa. Kuf, Ka. Resh, Ra, Shin, Sha, Sin, Sa, Tav, Ta. Good evening. Tonight we'll be looking at the eighth stanza of Psalm chapter 119, which is the portion of Chat. This portion of scripture is found in Psalm 119, verse 57 through 64. In reading from the ESV, it says, You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. And again, as we have heard in the sermons we have spoken on in Psalms chapter 119, is that it's acrostic and it's educational. And to put it simply, it's the ABCs of our spiritual life. Sometimes making things as simple as possible is the easy way to remember something. Sometimes God ways are the easiest. God says, here's my law and ways, obey them. It's pretty simple. Having our will fall in line with his is what's hard for us. God's ways are all spelled out in his written word. Simply laid out in the scriptures is where we find his ways. And that was the idea behind rehearsing the scriptures. They were to be very basic and foundational to our faith where they serve to function as the ABCs of our everyday spiritual life. Well, tonight we want to look at a major theme of Chet, obedience to God's word and how it was a priority to the psalmist. And we'll start in verse 57. It says, You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. And we see this concept of the Lord being our portion in Psalm 16, 5. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance. The Lord is our inheritance. In Psalm 47, 4, it says that he chooses our inheritance for us. In 1 Peter 1, it tells us that through salvation, we're born again to a living hope, and with that, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It's speaking of being heirs with Christ. Our eternal inheritance is wrapped up in him. One commentator said a better rendering of this verse in Psalm 119.57 is, This is my portion, O Lord, I said it, to keep thy words. And when you look at all the definitions and other verses associated with these words, portion, inheritance, and obedience, you see how often the two concepts are linked together. And it shows us that there's a correlation between our inheritance and our obedience to God's word. Now, I can't say from experience of being there, but I do remember someone saying that the joy in heaven is Christ himself. He is what makes heaven what it is. A thought that has always stuck with me, to know that it's him that's available for the taking and that he can be our portion, or in other words, our eternal destiny. And there's a famous quote from the author C.S. Lewis. He says, He who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. Again, a simple thought, but it carries an undeniable measure of truth behind it, and you can't argue with it. If you have an inherited Christ, you got it all. He is everything. And that should be our number one desire, that we inherit Christ as our portion, as the psalmist says here. What an amazing word of encouragement we can actually have while here on earth to know what our portion is for all eternity. And not just if and when we get there, that thought is for every day in our daily lives while here on earth. Mm -hmm. And knowing Christ is our portion, our inheritance, 
we should be all the more motivated for the next verse. In verse 58, it says, I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. In a wholeheartedness in seeking the Lord, there's a spiritual discipline required to seek the Lord. And like any discipline in our lives, you know, it's easier to let it go than to press in, especially when things get difficult. And any kind of exercise is easy-ish. When you have energy and motivation, you're feeling good, the sun is shining. But when you're tired and worn out, battle-worn, maybe even hurt or just discouraged, finding that motivation to exercise or stay disciplined is enough work in itself. And it can be the same spiritually. When everything's new and exciting, it takes little motivation to be all in, or we say on fire for God. But when the road gets hard, as we're promised it will be, when we move from the high of the joy of salvation to the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, it's then we need the spiritual discipline of seeking the Lord more than ever with our whole heart. So what is seeking the Lord? Well, it is actively pursuing God and doing it earnestly and sincerely. It is to do it with delight and to do it with all our heart, all of our being. And that requires a full commitment on our part in order to get our whole being involved, to seek his face with all our heart. It's a full-time job lumped on top of our busy lives of having full-time jobs. It's a lot, and it's no wonder we fail along the way or grow lax in areas of our lives. But there are times of fresh consecration and recommittal to pursue the Lord with fervor and fear. In the second half of that verse in 58, the psalmist says, be gracious to me according to your promise. The promise is that when we seek him, we will find him. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There are so many promises to believers in the word of God, but this one, that when we search for him, we will find him. And when we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Wow. That's the God of all heaven and earth saying, call to me. I will answer you. Not I'll think about it. I'll see if I'm busy. No, he is readily available to his children when we seek him with all of our heart. And moving on to verse 59, it says, I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. Now, the next portion in 119 called Tap may elaborate on this a little more, but this verse here alludes to the psalmist's need to be turned back or kept on track in his walk with the Lord. It's a healthy practice to consider our ways. When we don't take time to consider the path of our feet, we can end up somewhere we never planned. In Luke 15, 17, we have the story of the prodigal son. And it says there, when he came to his senses, you can kind of just picture him there at the pig's trough when it all sort of comes together for him and he thinks, how did I end up here? How did I get so far off track? And you know, we know he wasn't just over at the neighbor's farm because verse 20 says he was a long way off. He had lived wild and recklessly and most likely he had a really good time doing it until he found himself in a pig's trough. You know, pleasure seeking has a way of dulling our senses and keeping us occupied and distracted so we don't even have the time to consider our ways or the outcome of the choices we're making. And repentance can be a painful process, but the fruit of it is joy and peace. Eating with pigs and calculating how long it'll take you to get home is even more painful because the result is regret and sorrow. We could probably all remember a time in our lives, maybe spiritually, but I was thinking more literally, where we just weren't really paying attention and taking the time to consider where we were headed. It can happen easily when you're driving somewhere and get so caught up talking with someone you miss your turn or drive right by your exit. And here in Michigan, we're blessed with some really nice lakes and very long shorelines. And we kind of like to find our spot at the beach, drop all our stuff. Usually you kind of leave your stuff with someone else like your parents. And then you go for a long walk along the shore. And in some areas of Michigan, the beaches stretch for miles. And we've always liked to go look for stones, shells, lake glass, whatever, little beach treasures. Now, this illustration could kind of go either way, but to fit the point, I'm going to tell it this way. I can remember one specific beach walk as a group of teenagers, and Ken, I think, I think you were there. We were all talking, goofing around, looking for beach stuff, looking ahead. Oh, hey, let's go see what by that tree or that flag by the shore, whatever. And we completely lost track of time, and we didn't realize how far we had gone, so we basically ran out of the beach. We had walked all the way to a point where it became rocks and water. We looked back, and we realized we had walked for miles from our spot and from our parents. Now, I suppose maybe an island would be the exception, but here in Michigan, if you walk the beach in one direction, the only way back to your car and your parents and your ride home, whatever, is to turn around and start walking in the direction that you came. Now, I guess you could find a boat, but at this beach and with five teenagers, that was that likely. 
So all we could do was turn around and start the hike back. We were sunburnt, we were getting hungry, we were thirsty. You know, we had enjoyed ourselves, but we had gotten really distracted and we weren't looking ahead to, we were looking ahead to the things that were kind of piquing our interest, but we hadn't taken a moment to consider the way we were going. You know, just one voice of reason to say, hey, as far as you go, you're going to have to go back. That might have changed our decision, right? We also hadn't really considered our ways prior to starting the walk because we didn't take a snack, we didn't take any water, could have used a hat probably. But thankfully, we were young and easily entertained with each other. And our parents, on the other hand, weren't too happy, you know, when we finally got back. Now, I'm not comparing us to prodigal sons. That's not what I'm saying, but we were a long way off. And so for all of us who've been to a Michigan shoreline and walked the beach, it's just a righty picture of this idea that as far as you go away from your designated spot, you're going to have to turn and take those steps back. Now, the psalmist here took the time to consider his ways and chose to turn his steps to God's ways and adjust his course or line himself back up and consider where he was going in light of God's instruction. Now, we can save ourselves a lot of heartache if we would do this regularly and faithfully. Once every new year is great, but how much better if we continually make necessary adjustments rather than waiting until we're so far down the beach we have to turn around and walk all the way back. Now, steps is a vague term. I tend to think of steps as maybe just a few, but it can be many or few. I would rather consider my ways and take steps regularly to adjust than to disregard God's ways and have a marathon, roughly 55,375 steps, to return to that point. The simple act of reading our Bibles can be what helps keep us on track and adjust our steps. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've heard my pastor or Sunday school teacher remind me, read your Bible. And doesn't it seem like when we were younger, we heard it all the time. And no matter the topic, somehow pastor could just tie that in. But now I realize it's because it really cannot be said enough. You know, when you're young or you're young in the Lord, the Bible can be so daunting and reading it really takes discipline. But as the word becomes alive to you, you fall in love with it and reading it becomes such a joy and even an adventure. It becomes that guide to help us consider our ways. And as Ken mentioned, sometimes God's ways really are simple. Remember that kid's song, read your Bible, pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. In some ways, it's kind of that simple. Just taking that time and making a discipline of reading our Bible can be like a mirror for us to show us what's in our heart and in our life that doesn't align with God's ways. And it can show us where and how to turn our steps back to God's ways. Now, this is just an aside, but my favorite Sunday school story. When I was teaching the three to five-year-olds, I taught them that song, read your Bible, pray every day. And we'd sing it off and on for months. You know, we'd sing it in Sunday school. And one Sunday I went to sing it. And this little boy pipes up and he says, I don't like that song. I'm like, really? Well, why not? And he said, because I don't know how to read. He got me there. I had never even thought of the fact that they didn't know how to read. But to myself and to all of us who need that ongoing reminder to read your Bible, you can listen to it too. So whatever works for you, let that be the guide that helps you to consider your ways and order your steps so we don't get off track. And this ties right into the next verse, which says, I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Now, when we feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit, when God shows us an area that needs dealing with, a step we need to take, something we need to make right or get back on track, don't delay. Hasten means to cause something to happen quicker than it otherwise would. So chop, chop, we say, or get a move on. Be quick about it. Delayed obedience sounds acceptable, like you're still obeying, you're just kind of late to do it. But delayed obedience is disobedience. The longer we delay to obey God when he tells us to do something, the easier it becomes to ignore his voice and not do it at all. It's kind of like a kid playing a video game. Yeah, mom, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, okay. Just, yeah, just one more level. And next thing you know, 20 minutes goes by, the afternoon goes by, the day's over. Mom is not going to be happy with you. You didn't obey. You know, we can easily get distracted and drown out that still small voice of God that's calling out to us and directing us to a step of obedience. But delayed obedience is disobedience. There won't be a more convenient time, especially for repentance, no matter how much we try to convince ourselves. You know, other versions say, I hurried without hesitating. As soon as you command, I do what you say. I keep your commandments eagerly. That's like next level obedience. Now we're not just obeying, but obeying quickly and with a good attitude. We had just spoken of the idea of seeking the Lord, but I want to consider a verse that ties both of these thoughts together. 
In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. So it's seeking while he may be found. It's very important. Mm -hmm. There is a time and a place where we are able to glean the full measure of grace and faith in order to do what he is asking of us. If we tarry, we may not receive that full measure. It's vital to the task to drop what we are doing and act on what the Lord is telling us. There is a time where he can be found by seeking him out and remaining close to him. And like in a movie, we don't want to be those that miss the bus that's departing at a certain time and we show up at the station to see the opportunity driving off and we're left standing there in the dust wondering what's next. So seek the Lord, a eureka moment, that aha moment, a moment of discovery, to find what you're looking for, to locate the one thing you have been desperately searching for. And maybe we haven't been desperate enough. Maybe we need to be put into a place of absolute desperation in order to recognize that He is who we are to be scouring the room looking for and only resting when we have laid a hold of Him. It's only then that we can say that we hastened to His Word and obeyed His commandment. So just in closing, we want to consider this portion of Psalm 119, 57 through 60 and follow the psalmist's example. Let's make obedience to God's Word a priority in our lives. Let's obey quickly, eagerly, fully, because we know our reward in heaven is great. It's Christ himself. And next week, we'll be back to consider the second half of Chef. Lord bless you. Thank you, Ken and Hill, for that message on what the Bible says about Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. It's the section referred to as Chef. As they pointed out, having our own will line up with God's will well, that's difficult. That's a lifelong process. Obedience to his word, however, is the key for our life. We must consider the path of our feet along the way. Where am I headed? Where are you headed? Sometimes, as Ken and Hill pointed out, we need to turn around and walk to God once again. Walking to the Lord includes little steps like faithfully being in his word every day. We want to obey quickly and fully. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and just say, Lord, we want to consider our path and we want to turn towards you with all of our heart and follow you in every aspect of our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this message tonight. And Lord, as, as you say, we want to assess our path, consider the path we're on and much of the time when we do that, Lord, we realize we need to turn to you. And as they so well illustrated, we need to walk the beach back to you, back to your will, back to your purposes. Lord, we want you to be that shining, guiding light in all aspects of our lives. Move in us the rest of this week. Speak to our hearts as we pursue you, as we're faithfully in your word, even this week, Lord. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.